good morning to everybody. And first of all, thank you very much, Katja Maurer and Thomas Seibert, and also to Eva Wuchold for the summary and for her valuable list of yeah, what's actually demands. My name is Anselm Franke. I'm curator at the House of Kulturen der Welt in Berlin. And our next guest has been a frequent speaker there. Just briefly, a few technical details. Live simultaneous translation can be activated via going onto the globe symbol on the bottom of the menu bar. English, um, um, and they uh, can. So you can listen in German, Spanish, or French using the interpretation function offered by Zoom using the globe symbol. And at this point already, thank you very much to the interpreters. We'll first hear Akil Mbembe's presentation. And after that, we have two guests to join us for the panel session on further discussion. And we'll then also be opening it up for the audience. Riyad Otman of Medico will support me and will bundle the questions that you will please hand in using the Q&A function of Zoom only. And he will cluster them and give them into the panel and possibly summarize them or combine a few questions into one. A quick question to the team at Medico. Our speaker, has he dialed in? Is he actually in the conference? Because a few minutes ago, we had the problem that Akil Mbembe wasn't yet in the Zoom conference. OK, not yet, right. For as long as Akil hasn't joined us, I'll just continue speaking in German and we'll introduce him. I presume that we're trying to contact him by phone in the background and I hope that he'll be able to join us soon. Now, Akil Mbembe is a philosopher from Cameroon and a political theorist and philosopher and mostly he is a public intellectual and is amongst the most important voices when it comes to dealing with the heritage of colonialism, but also contemporary African philosophy. Akil Mbembe has taught at universities like Berkeley in California, Harvard, Columbia, London, Yale, New Haven and Harvard, and has now for a while worked at the Johannesburg University of Witzwaterland, which is where he also resides. His publications have been translated into numerous languages. The most important amongst them are Critique de la Raison Negre, also published in German. And then Politique de l'Inimité, Negro Politics, published the year before last. And from what I've understood, it's just being translated uh, Brutalisme, a book that he published in 2020. And it is also in connection with this book that we're going to hear from him today. He's also a co-founder of the think tank Atelier de la Pensée at Dakar, also with Felvincin. And he's a frequent speaker also in Germany and also one who has received a number of awards, amongst others the 36th Geschwister or Scholl Siblings Award for his book Critique de la Raison Negre. And obviously he's also 
known for those who weren't aware of him previously because of uh, quite a controversy that took place in Germany last year where he found himself in the crossfire of German remembrance culture and a changing, let's say, political tectonic situation. Which might be a prime example, actually, of the problems that Germany, but also Europe, still encounter when it comes to coming to an understanding, a structural understanding of racification in modern biopolitics, which is a central issue of Akil Mbembe's publications. The entire question of our political constitutionality, a global order which may be at a media, at a technological level, and if you want also in an economic manner, a world society put in relation. But that's certainly not true in political terms. And certainly not true when it comes to rights, as we've heard repeatedly. So my question, has Akhil joined us by now? Can you hear me? I just contacted Akhil Mbembe by phone. There was a problem with the link. We're working on a solution, says the tech support. We hope he'll join us any minute now. OK, to make sure we don't overrun too much, I would use the opportunity to introduce the two panel guests that will join us after Akhil's input. And I'll do that in English. Nach dem Vortrag von Akhil after Akhil Mbembe's input, we'll be hearing short statements, so replies to his input by Yvonne adiambo -Ovur. Writer and um, also uh, been translated to the German and... Uh, yes, I'm Fina. I, <laughs> I, I have heard. I'm so sorry. <laughs> had a hard no time worries. Uh, we are glad that you're with us. Okay. So, Akhil, um, I have already introduced you, um, uh, and I'm just quickly uh, announcing the panelists after your after your okay. talk. Um, okay. So, I have just been in the process of uh, presenting uh, Adiambo Ovur, um, okay. who, among others, uh, won the prestigious British Kane Prize for African Writing and. Um, also the Yomo Kenyatta Prize for Literature, um, and the Dragonfly Seas, uh, her second novel, has also been widely um, discussed in uh, German media. Um, our second panelist is Sabina Haag, who is a professor at the TU, the Technical University in Berlin, where she's uh, she has been heading the Center for Interdisciplinary Women's and Gender Studies, and she is one of the founding figures and leading voices of queer theory in uh, the, the German academia um, and its wider activist um, uh, resonance um, in this country. So I'm uh, extending my warm welcome to our panelists. Um, as I announced before, Riyad Othman uh, from uh, Medico International will um, later join occasionally into the discussion by basically um, moderating um, or translating some of the questions posed by uh, you, all our listeners, in the Q&A function. Um, once again, if you want to listen uh, in, in the German, in French or in Spanish, uh, please press the interpretation button the globe symbol at the uh, bottom of your Zoom window. And um, with this, I think um, I'm just uh, handing over the word to Achille. Um, a very warm welcome again. Um, and we are very happy that you are joining us today. Uh, th thank you very much, Anselm. I'm sorry we had a little bit of uh, technical problems, but, but it's fine now. Uh, first of all, I, I, would, um, I would like to thank uh, Thomas and his team uh, for the uh, very kind uh, invitation. Uh, for reasons I do not need to dwell on, 
I, I hesitated a lot when he, he invited me to, to, to join. Um, but as I understand uh, it, uh, this conference is, is supported amongst other institutions by the uh, Frederick Ebert Foundation and by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation uh, is very present in, in Africa where it has been working uh, in solidarity with various local organizations for a very long time. And uh, I myself have uh, been involved in, in some of this work. I thought uh, I should provide um, a little bit of context to the set of reflections I would like to share with you. Uh, just like the rest of the work I have been involved in over the last uh, decades, uh, these reflections um, are part of uh, a deliberate attempt to, to read the world from Africa and uh, to, to read Africa not at all as a separate but as an integral part of the world. Now, you will ask me, but what does reading the world from Africa allow us to see? And to see with the kind of clarity, the kind of urgency we might not necessarily experience if we read the world from elsewhere. What is it? that uh, Africa uh, somewhat allow us to understand about our contemporary condition uh, and uh, about what it is that we need to reconstruct. So I would like to make a few brief points about that, if only to uh, help you to understand uh, where, where I'm coming from. It seems to me that as the, uh, the new century unfolds, uh, many, both within the continent and elsewhere, people of goodwill elsewhere, are increasingly uh, acknowledging that uh, there is no better laboratory than the Southern Hemisphere in general, and, and Africa in particular, a better laboratory not only to gauge the limits of our uh, knowledges, our epistemological imagination, if you want, but also to apprehend and describe novelty and originality, to, to if you want, account for the multiple pathways and trajectories of transformation in our world today. That's the first reason why Africa is of importance for the, uh, uh, the, the, the topic that uh, has brought us together. I would go as far as to argue that uh, Africa is one of the, uh, the key epicenters of contemporary global transformations, as well as those transformations that are ahead of us, that are to come. I say this because, for instance, uh, uh, here, and by here, I mean here in Africa, here, uh, most of the issues we tend to couch, for instance, in the materialist language of economics, or of political economy, uh, concepts such as development, uh, economic growth, macroeconomic stability, uh, problems such as uh, whether there is a, a route for Africa's rise out of poverty, uh, or whether there is an alternative model of growth, most of these categories here, 
ultimately point to a fundamental question, one fundamental question. What is that one fundamental question? It is the following, how will we carry life on? How will we carry life on for everyone and for everything? Not for some, to the exclusion of others, life for everyone and for everything. There's no better place on earth where that question assails us in its urgency and in its clarity and in its radicality. So, seen from uh, the African experience, the question is not simply to reconstruct the world. It is what kind of world do we need to reconstruct? And here, I would argue that we need to reconstruct a kind of world that has a place for everyone and everything. This seems to me absolutely crucial and it's a lesson that comes from uh, the African experience. A world that has a place for everyone, for everything, by which I mean for all livings, both now and into the indefinite future. This question of temporality, of uh, inhabitation of a time uh, that is, if you want, durable, a time that is, is a sustainable time. Not whatever time, not the time of cynicism, uh, of hate, but a time that is sustainable, that is durable, because it creates the condition for uh, expanding the realms of, of life uh, in the face of all which threatens it uh, from its inception to, to, to its end. So uh, it's clear, uh, once again, speaking from from the continent, it is clear that uh, uh, such a horizon uh, is, um, um, let's say, being mapped at a, at a time uh, when um, old questions remain. Very old questions remain. Um, they have been with us for a very long time. The question is, why is it that we haven't been able to resolve them? Why are they still with us? All questions remain, although the context has changed. And uh, the new context, as far as I can see, is characterized by a few things, key of which is the... Um, a redrawing of the global map of development. Um, for instance, uh, the conditions that allowed for uh, the resurgence of growth uh, in Africa in the last decade of the 20th century and the first uh, decade of the 21st century, those conditions uh, were based on, a, I would say, on a particular conjuncture of commodity booms accelerated extraction of raw materials and an intense uh, financialization. And uh, currently, global trends point towards increasing divergence and polarization uh, in the sense that uh, uh, as far as we are concerned in any case, the uh, international legal and regulatory architecture, uh, which has uh, often curtailed Africa's autonomy uh, remains uh, in place. But so too are the uh, are various multilateral uh, bilateral agreements uh, that uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, validate uh, the uh, hegemony of global capital uh, in different ways. Now, the fact is that the, uh, the redrawing of, of the global map of, of development uh, might not only result in, in furthering inequalities uh, between countries uh, and entire regions, it is also uh, underpinned, this uh, redrawing of the global map of development, uh, by uh, growing concerns with insulation. Uh, insulation uh, from risks, insulation from, from dangers of, of all kinds. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is that uh, part of what we see is that risk uh, is pushed away. It's even increasingly outsourced uh, while uh, large parts of the world are seen as uh, no-go zones or they are subjected to, to new forms of, uh, of remote management, which is, which is not exactly what colonialism was, although colonialism had uh, that uh, dimension of, uh, of remote management. But uh, I think colonialism was much more paradoxical in the sense that it combined uh, both um, remote management and body-to-body uh, a struggle, uh, uh, proximate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, engagement. But, but uh, uh, new forms of remote management are, uh, are emerging. And in this context of uh, uh, precarity and insecurity, uh, as well as uh, uh, extreme mobility of capital and technological in innovation, uh, there is a big risk. The risk is that of not reconstructing the world. The risk is for entire regions of the world to, to be perceived as uh, zones of uh, permanent emergency, uh, uh, more suited to humanitarian interventions than to uh, uh, what I would consider to be a, a future-oriented uh, development strategy. In any case, this redrawing of the global map of development um, singularly complicates the task of rebuilding the world. In fact, it is leading to the increasing divergence between, I would say, three competing models of development. What are those three competing models of development? The first is uh, development as a permanent emergency, short-term oriented, context in which people are wondering how to make it from today to tomorrow. The second is development as a, a techno-managerial and extractive project. And the third is development as a, a long-run structural transformation of society and of humanity. This leads me then to put forward a few ideas as to how we might begin to reconstruct the world from the continent. I think that to reconstruct the world from Africa, we will need to shift focus in terms of global development thought and practice. That's what we learn from look to the African experience. We need to shift focus first in relation to what I would call the two-way relation between global norms and local practice. Why? Because for global norms to be useful, they must be embedded in local histories and cultures and in locally grown programs, uh, if you want. 
Second, it seems to me that to reconstruct the world from the kind of perspective I have been uh, talking about, which is not so much peculiar to Africa, but I'm speaking from here, to reconstruct the world from this perspective, development properly understood should not start from needs and problems. It should build on local assets, local strengths and possibilities. What I mean by that is that we must shift our focus of attention from needs to assets. Assets consisting not only in capital investments, uh, but including the physical, ecological, environmental, social, and cultural attributes, uh, assets including communities to which we must turn, their knowledge, their institutions, their memories, and their collective intelligence. The aim being to strengthen the generative capacities. And that's how we'll rebuild the world, I would argue, from an African perspective, by investing in generative capacities, the generative capacities of communities. But once we have said that, all I have just shared, we still have to confront further questions. And I would now like to begin to move towards those questions, uh, maybe leaving a little Af bit Africa behind, and uh, let's see, uh, expanding uh, the scope of our uh, interrogation. For instance, what do we mean by everyone and by everything? Two key terms for me which have really to be at the center of our reflection. Uh, when we say everyone, is everyone, is everything the sum total of minimally existing entities? Entities then joined uh, together into ever larger and more complex structures and infrastructures, the technosphere, for instance. Is it what we mean by everyone and everything? Or by everyone and everything, we mean we refer to a fluid, uh, heterogeneous, let's just call it plenum, from within which things emerge as this plenum crumples and folds, an open plenum, open to itself and open to the world. It's a question of the openness to a world that is larger than our own individual existence, our national existence, um, human existence, because it's a world which embraces all living beings and living entities. How does such a concept of everything and everyone, how does it affect, for instance, our concepts, concept of durability, of which I was speaking about a moment ago, especially at a time when we witness an increasing merging of ecological and health crisis, for instance. Um, COVID-19 being a manifestation of this uh, merging of ecological and health uh, crisis. But uh, of course, there have been many others before COVID, uh, which have resulted in the loss of life most often premature, of hundreds of uh, millions of, of people. 
I think we have to bring such questions on, on the table. In any case, uh, when we speak from the continent, we are forced to uh, address, address them. Whatever the case, it seems to me that uh, confronting the, uh, the dominant forces uh, threatening the um, ecological balance of the planet and its habitability uh, today, um, creating uh, new horizons of, of hope, uh, of equality and justice, all of this hinges directly on this matter of life futures. So that's uh, the first set of remarks or observations uh, I wanted to, to share. Now let me move to a second set of uh, remarks and uh, ob observations, um, most of which um, have to do with whether or not the uh, liberal order um, we have inherited um, does still have the capacity to help us to make that, that leap. Whether uh, the liberal international order we have inherited um, could be a resource for reconstructing the world or whether it has reached uh, limits it is totally unable to, to transcend uh, and therefore we might want to look for something else. So that's the um, second set of uh, reflections I would like to uh, put forward. And um, they, if you want, uh, have mostly to do with uh, what seems to me to be the pitfalls and the foreclosures of the liberal order. I could go on and on about this, but let me uh, just put it succinctly. It strikes me the extent to which we are witnessing the, um, the proliferation and the uh, condensation of, of potentially deadly conflicts that uh, can uh, hardly be contained, adjudicated for, negotiated within uh, the, um, the framework of uh, uh, what we could call the liberal order. This, we are seeing it including in the most so-called advanced democracies. Such conflicts, I think, are increasingly the expression of, of contending and even irreconcilable ways of being. Often happening within uh, divided nation states, nation states in which uh, large segments of the people with contrasting sets of commitments share almost nothing in common. This question of what is it that we share? Is there anything we might point to which can be identified as common to all of us? Increasingly, when we look at uh, the politics of our day, politics of our times, we are forced to observe that in most instances things go as if we didn't owe each other any debt or obligation whatsoever. As if in fact we only aspire to secede or to separate. So to some extent the dream of apartheid 
is still alive. If we understand by apartheid in its original sense, the act of separating, the act of secession, seceding, the refusal to consider that we might have a common biography, a common biography we might want to write together. So liberal democracies are increasingly at war with themselves, first of all, around issues such as their commitment to closed or open worlds, commitment to the idea of an open society, for instance, an open society for whom, at the exclusion of whom else, within what limits, or their commitment to what uh, political theorist David Goldberg calls heterogeneous social ecologies. They deeply disagree, for instance, on whether they should let inequality spiral or whether some form of regulation is necessary to ensure relative fairness. And most of these conflicts of a basic values are unfolding in the absence of basic agreements concerning what is legitimate, what is not, <clears throat> or what is true and what is fake. The politics of, of truth. So it seems to me that uh, <clears throat> this is not conducive to uh, the reconstruction of the world. It's hardly um, conducive to that. Let me add to that something which, for those of us who uh, live here in, in, in Africa, in South Africa in particular, but also elsewhere, <clears throat> added to what I have said is uh, something which we should talk about, we cannot not speak about, the return of uh, forms of violence predicated on, on, on race. The question of the uh, persistence of, of racism, and in particular, of anti-black racism. In the US, in Europe, but also uh, in other parts of, of the world. Which forces me to make a few observations on the uh, core contradiction which has in fact always been at the uh, core of modern liberal societies. The contradiction between democracy and racism. Especially in societies in which domination by race was a formal feature um, whose characteristics I think it is worth recalling briefly, and that's what I'm going to do very quickly. What were those kinds of societies? How did they look like? What were their main features? Let me highlight three. First of all, these were bifurcated societies. Bifurcation in the case of the US, for instance, or in the case of South Africa under apartheid, bifurcation of blacks 
bifurcation of whites and everything uh, in the middle. And even when blacks became formally free, as in the United States, the indignity they suffered continued to be cast as natural, as inevitable, precisely in this context in which bifurcation was codified as the law of the land. And that's the first feature. There's a second one in the sense that take South Africa, take the US, southern US, Brazil to some extent, and other uh, historically racist formations. Whites uh, depended to a large extent uh, on black care, slave care, uh, for that matter. Slaves were seen as others, uh, to be sure, but they were the kinds of others whom whites needed. They needed them. They depended upon them, whether they were aware of this or not. But, and this is the crux of the matter, the slave society legislated against white care and concern for those enslaved. In the sense that it was against the law to care for or to be concerned about those on whom one depended upon and whose existence's raison d'etre was to care for those who enslaved them. That is the key contradiction of racism in uh, uh, early modern liberal order. So the social arrangements were such that the enslavers, the colonizers you might want to say, did not in fact face any undue moral challenge whenever they brutalized or neglected those who cared for them and on whom they depended. And not facing any undue moral dilemma was not accidental. This was how they could suppress any reparative impulse toward those they had enslaved or colonized. So if you want, the crux of racism is that it helps the racists to preserve the fiction of themselves as self-sufficient, reliant on no one but themselves. And where colonialism, let's say colonial racism prevailed, the tendency was also to, to constantly shift responsibility to those one had harmed And such harms, rather than being acknowledged, rather than being felt, instead were denied and repressed. And this is what led to permanent acquiescence, equanimity or resignation in accepting the disparate quality of life and life chances uh, for the enslaved uh, and the colonized and, and the enslavers and colonizers on the other hand. One last point. Key was the idea of an essential difference, permanent incompatibility. Uh, this was in fact the linchpin of, of what is known as white supremacy, uh, whether in the US or uh, in South Africa. Uh, it was also the hallmark of uh, modern racism, the key psychic imaginary, it relied upon the idea that there was an essential difference, there was nothing in common, there was permanent incompatibility between, uh, uh, let's see, uh, 
different uh, so-called races. What I mean by that is that I want to highlight the enduring problems of, of racism as a uh, theater to, let's say, the project of uh, uh, a liberal order. Having said all of this, let me now, and I'm moving towards the end, say one or two words about whether or not we can reconstruct the world on the sole basis of the defense of the so-called values of the Enlightenment, or whether we can reconstruct the world on the basis of something we could call Kantian cosmopolitanism. Since these two, uh, let's say, uh, key uh, questions are with us, we are debating them uh, uh, in Europe, in America, in, uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, here in South Africa and elsewhere. We have those who believe that these are the resources we need to mobilize in order to uh, keep the world as it is, or, or for that matter, change it and reconstruct it. I don't want to go into too much details here. But for those of you who might have forgotten, Kant uh, developed his idea of cosmopolitanism in in toward perpetual peace, that book. He did the same in his doctrine of right, and he did the same in his discussions on colonialism. But I would argue that his cosmopolitanism, just as the cosmopolitanism of the Neo-Kantians, those who are trying to uh, keep him alive. This, his cosmopolitanism was, might have been concerned, we have to check, with questions of injustice and political responsibility at the level of, of the world at large, but it was certainly not based on the axiom of equal concern for all subjects, regardless of membership or affiliation. It certainly wasn't based on the concern for what I have termed everyone and everything. It falls short when measured up against what I told you is a big concern in the continent, everyone and everything. Of course, there is a moral condemnation of colonialism in Kant, especially in the third article uh, of his, he calls them definitive articles. There's a condemnation of colonialism when he discusses issues of quote-unquote settlement, or if you want in contemporary parlance, colonial occupation. And this you find it in the metaphysics uh, of morals. But in fact, these are not at all well elaborated critiques of colonialism. And an even more serious indictment, if you want to use such a term, is that Kant's overall project of cosmopolitanism is compatible with hierarchical beliefs about race and civilization, which Kant explicitly espoused in earlier work. His geography, uh, his... Uh, work on, on uh, aesthetics and so forth and so 
So, uh, in fact, rather than coming to grips with the nature of colonial injustice, uh, he focuses on intra-European colonial conflicts. He judges these intra-European conflicts in faraway lands too unbridled to contribute to perpetual peace. This was his main concern, a concern which uh, had no uh, or little correspondence with the questions of, of global injustice uh, at that time and, uh, of course, uh, today. What does this tell us? And I'll draw the consequences of what I have just said. It means that we cannot reconstruct the world on the, only on the basis of Kantian cosmopolitanism. We can't because him and neo-Kantians do not take seriously intellectual resources and political practices from outside the West. They don't take them seriously. This is despite the fact that here, Africa, Latin America, Southern Hemisphere in general, the fact that these regions have historically been at the receiving end of global wrongs, which cosmopolitanism aims to right. And that, uh, um, as a consequence, these regions have well-developed traditions of thought and political practice with insight about global justice, about the reconstruction of the world, the conditions under which the world could be remade anew. So this is partly why um, neo-Kantianism, Kantianism and neo-Kantianism have not been able to, to put forward a credible theory of world justice or a post-Eurocentric vision of cosmopolitanism. I could go on and on on this. Let me now conclude. I have made a critique of the liberal order. I have highlighted the limits of Kantian cosmopolitanism. If all of this is not enough, is insufficient, on what basis could we reimagine what I call an ethics of the common earth, which is the direction seen from the continent we should probably be following, moving towards an ethics of the common earth. I'll say two or three things about it and I'll stop. If we are to move towards an ethics of the common earth, which comes not so much as a corrective to classical cosmopolitanism or ideas of perpetual peace, but opens up an entirely new horizon. If we are to move in that direction, then first of all, we need to look for other archives. This question of the archives. We need to look for other archives. We need to, because the question of the adequacy of the concepts, the outlooks, the evaluative practices inherited and transmitted from the, the past, the recent past, the past of one of the many provinces of the world. That question has to be raised. It has to be raised because, as we now agree, there is a radical rupture in the reality of nature. There is a radical rupture in the reality of the earth. There is a radical rupture 
in the reality of the human. And this rupture, these ruptures, if you want, must be answered by an equally radical discontinuity in culture, by, if you want, new forms of thinking, thinking on a planetary scale. We won't reconstruct the world if we are not able to think at a planetary scale. That's the first reason. Second, to reconstruct a kind of world that has a place for everyone and everything, we must interrogate the adequacy of traditional concepts and categories in ethics. Why? Because thinking as we have been taught to think about the world hasn't stopped us producing ethical blind spots and practical mistakes. In the uh, now, in the past, as well as in the future. Why? Because what we perceive to be good reasons and sound values in one place is not necessarily the same in another place. So a self-critical perspective is, is essential. People do not only make errors. They are also capable of self-deception. And in relation to other parts of the world, the West has often been self-deceptive about what it proclaims, what it does, and why. We know that from our own experience uh, in, in Africa. Now, let me end. In this age of the Anthropocene, we need to move beyond cosmopolitanism toward a new ethics of the Earth. A new ethics of the Earth, meaning the a new idea of a common, I wouldn't even say ownership of the world, of the Earth, but a common custodianship of the Earth. The idea of the Earth as a common in an attempt at uh, bringing together both distributive and reparative justice, both of which are uh, in, in, uh, uh, very often, uh, let's say, uh, put uh, uh, up one against the other. The other. So uh, this would require then rethinking questions such as um, the possibility of an original natural right, um, which would somewhat uh, limit, um, let's say, uh, put a hold on the continuing legitimacy of, of property conventions, um, the idea that all humans uh, might be considered to have symmetrical moral status when it comes to justifying principles for the distribution of Earth's original spaces and resources, uh, but not only all humans, also all other living entities. Thank you very much.